you might have noticed, but there are a lot of agendas at play in our world today. Lots of people and organizations that kind of have their own plans, have their own agendas, and are calling us to get on board with them. You might have heard of Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030 put out by the UN. If you don't know anything about that, don't worry. Every political party have their own agenda. Sometimes they can be different before the election and a little bit different after. <clears throat> Things like the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, women's rights issues, LGBTQI, climate control advocates, different countries like Russia who are kind of doing their own thing at the moment. I watched an episode of 60 Minutes last week about uh, TikTok and how a group in China are using TikTok to find out information on the rest of the world. You thought your funny dance moves were safe, hey? No. From TV ads to TV shows, whether they're trying to sell you a product or an idea, a way of living, way of thinking, businesses, they're trying to do something, they're trying to achieve something, and their interest is not so much you, but your wallet. I mean, think of your local shopping centers, You think they're selling Easter eggs for Jesus' sake? Your friends, your family, even you. Everyone has an agenda. What's yours? What's the agenda that drives your life? What is your life on about? I mean, hopefully it's not a hidden agenda. Maybe the word agenda gives you shivers as you think about your work meetings. There's a guy from church here who... He wouldn't turn up to his meetings at work unless his boss had provided him a clear agenda with plenty of time before the meeting. Because he wanted to know what what was he in for? I get myself into. We all live by some agenda, being driven by something. We all think certain things are more important than others, and that kind of drives everything else we do. And we often find ourselves calling others to kind of get on our agenda. Think that's important. You know, support my footy team. Don't buy a Jeep, only buy Toyotas. You know, uh, work hard now, buy a house, rest easy later. Don't settle down too early. Go and travel the world first. And the advice goes on. Or maybe for you, you haven't realized that you've actually been living life by the agenda of someone or something else. By your boss's agenda. By your family's. By our culture. Well, Jesus is going to challenge us today to consider what our own agenda is. And he's going to reveal his to us and help us weigh up the cost of getting either on board with his or not. Now, the continual responses to Jesus up until this point in Matthew's gospel have been kind of one of three. Firstly, you've got complete disbelief, just ignorance, hard resistance. I don't want to know anything about you. On the other side, you've got misunderstanding, kind of interested but confused. And then in the middle, you've got others who have just expressed genuine belief, entrusted themselves to him, given them over, given themselves over to Jesus. And we see the first two of those responses in the first section of this chapter in Matthew. From verses 1 to 4, we see the Pharisees again in just complete resistance. They're not interested in what Jesus has to say. They don't care who he's con- continuously revealed himself to be. They just want to accuse him, condemn him, and keep themselves from ever having to change in any way. And in verses 5 to 12, we see the disciples misunderstanding Jesus again. And it's quite a funny little section if you read it later on, 5 to 12. After seeing miracle after miracle, teaching upon teaching, they still don't quite get the things that he's doing and saying. But unlike the Pharisees, where it says in verse 4, Jesus just walked away from them, Those who are interested, confused, but keen to know more, he invites them in to think about who he is. And we see that from verse 13 onwards, and that's where we're going to pick it up in this section. Have a look at verse 13, 14 with me. This will be on screen. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. Now, Jesus has been calling himself the Son of Man throughout Matthew's gospel, and it can be a little bit strange. Now, on one level, it really just means he's a guy, like he's a human, he's a son of someone. But on another level, it's a reference to the Old Testament scriptures, to the book of Daniel, where Daniel gets this vision of one like a son of man, like a human, but much more profound. 
Have a look at what Daniel sees. This is Daniel 7, written about 500 years before Jesus turns up. It says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This Son of Man vision is a glimpse of one who will be a divine king, an ultimate governor, one who's been given power and authority from above, from on high. And for centuries, God's people were wondering, who is this guy? Who is it going to be? And here we see Jesus all the way through Matthew's gospel revealing himself as that one. One bearing God's power over creation, being able to calm the sea, to walk on water. He's healing incurable diseases. One who speaks with God's authority on things to do with God's law. As you might remember back in chapter 5, he says, You have heard, but I tell you. The one who claims to have God's authority to forgive sin. Now, of course, when Jesus asks them this question, who do people say I am, he himself knows what people are saying about him. But he's here giving them a moment to reflect on where they sit compared to what everybody else says. And so he presses into them in verse 15, okay, yeah, 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 that's what others say, but what about you, he asks? Who do you say that I am? Just a side note here, this is so important, but so often we can think that we're Christian because our family goes to church, or we go to church with our family, or with our spouse, or we've just kind of been around church so long, it's just kind of part of who we are now. But being Christian isn't just an association with a group of people. You're not good with God because your family goes to church. No, being Christian is a personal relationship with God through Jesus. As Jesus asks this question to his disciples here, he's also asking each and every one of us today, who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answers, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, Messiah there is the Hebrew word for the Greek word we know, which is Christ, which means king, God's king. Peter recognizes him to be that king from Daniel's vision. For all Peter's faults and failures, he's got this right. In the next few verses, verses 17 to 19, Jesus tells Peter that the fact that he even knows this, the fact he's able even to declare this, has been a gift from God the Father. Knowing this is a spiritual miracle. And that it's this confession of who Jesus is and his identity that will be the rock, the firm foundation that the church is continued to be built on for the ages to come. It's this truth about Jesus that holds the keys to open heaven's doors. And I wonder, who would you say Jesus is? Is he your king? Is he your God? Well, from here, Jesus begins to help them see what it really means for him to be the Messiah. And it's a little bit different to being called the CEO of a large company. Verse 21, have a look at what he says. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Years ago, I uh, found myself with a friend walking home from a nightclub. This is pre, pre-Christian days. And uh, he was telling me about this funds transfer thing that he and his brother have, had got themselves into. And he said that if he got caught, he'd end up in a lot of trouble. And at the time, I kind of wasn't paying much attention. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, sounds a bit dodgy, but I didn't really think much of it. But that friend did end up getting caught, and he spent a number of years in prison. I should have been paying more attention to what he was saying. I wonder, did you just catch what Jesus said? How would you have responded if he said that to you? It's easy just to read over it, isn't it? Well, Peter was paying attention. Look at what he said next, verse 22. Peter took him aside 
and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Now, on one level, of course, Peter's going to respond like this, right? He's just spent three years with this guy. He's left all that he has to follow him. He's seen the amazing things he's been doing. He's just confessed that he thinks he's God's savior of the world. I mean, for him to now die a gruesome, shameful death at the hands of his own people, I mean, like, no, no, this is not going to happen. That's a big fail, Jesus. That's kind of an obvious response. But on another level, he's kind of missed the point. Did you notice how Jesus said in that section there that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer? And he must be killed and rise again. If he truly is the Messiah sent from God, then this is what he must do. This is how God's true king leads and saves his people. Not through military force like they wanted him to, not through an uprising, not through protests, not the weapons of this world, not by nice philosophical ideas, but by an act of utter mercy on behalf of sinners like you and I. Just as it was predicted in the Old Testament scriptures. It says in Isaiah, this was written 700 years before Jesus turned up, Isaiah 53 verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. See, there's no other way for humanity to see God's face apart from Jesus stepping in to take our punishment. Peter should have known this. But just stop for a moment and imagine that, Pe- that Jesus listened to Peter when he pulled him aside. Just imagine. There's Jesus, and he's like, hey, you're right, bro. I don't want to do this. It's going to be horrible. And just decided that he'd just lay low for the next number of years, just go around, still teaching people and healing people's diseases, diseases maybe just become the local witch doctor. Where would that have left us? Still stuck in our sin? No hope of anything beyond the grave apart from judgment? and an eternity separated from God's goodness, essentially in hell. What looks like a nice gesture from Peter here is a moment in history that could have taken away the hope of Easter forever. Thankfully, Jesus was on guard. Have a look at verse 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Whoa. The guy who just declared Jesus to be the king of the world is now called Satan by Jesus. What is going on here? Well, it's just as Jesus said there. Peter's got the wrong agenda. Jesus isn't saying here that Peter is actually Satan, but that that way of thinking is exactly what Satan would want. Did you notice what kind of thinking was that? Did you notice it in the verse? Merely human concerns. Merely human thinking. The kind of agendas that I mentioned earlier. Agendas that have good intentions, but can easily distract us from living out the concerns of God. Agendas that are important, but are not eternal. Agendas that help but do not and cannot save. Jesus goes on now to make clear what it looks like for us to leave behind merely human thinking and get on board with his eternal agenda. Look what he says from verse 24 to 26. And Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Now, the disciples here don't know yet that Jesus is going to be crucified. But they do know what it means for someone to be carrying their cross. See, in that context, in that time, if you ever saw somebody carrying their cross, you knew that it meant, they were on their way to death. 
by that point, with that cross on their back, they had given up pleading their case for anything else to get in the way of that destination. It was complete surrender to the will of another. Jesus says here, if we want to follow him, we must completely surrender our will to him. Let go of all the other things that are going to get in the way of Jesus' agenda. Consider them even dead to us and even in the way of what he's doing. He says in verse 25, trying to find life somewhere else apart from him will only end in losing that life. May kind of make sense, right? Like if God made life and life is found in him, he's the source of life, then there is absolutely nothing else in all creation that could take the place of giving life apart from God himself. But Jesus says when we give up that desire to find life in those things, when we lose our lives for him, we give up trying to find purpose and satisfaction and meaning in the things that God has made and find it in him, that's when and where we find true life. Verse 26, Jesus asks, what good would it be to gain the whole world but lose our soul? Or what could anyone give in exchange for it? I just think of the person who spends their whole life building their property portfolio, literally owning parts of the world, now on their deathbed, about to lose it all. How much do you think the number in their bank account matters now? Not at all. It's about to slip right through their fingers into someone else's hands, possibly the bank. You see, you can have it all, but it doesn't matter on the day of judgment when God demands our souls from us. I love what famous actor Jim Carrey said a few years ago. Where he said this, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Our soul is the most valuable thing we have. And God has offered us one thing for us to redeem it. His own son's life. To reject that and try to offer him something else is not just foolish, but absolutely offensive. It'd be kind of like driving your car into a pedestrian on a zebra crossing and crushing their legs under your car, and then getting out of the car and going around with your wallet and trying to give them some money to make it all better. Hey, just take some of this. Everything will be okay. That's just not going to work, is it? We come into this world with nothing, and we'll exit with less unless we let Jesus offer us his very life. It's his agenda, or it's literally the highway to hell. But I want us just to stop for a minute and consider that agenda. Because it's not a life of drudgery and oppression and a list of do's and don'ts that steal all the joy out of life like some people can think it is. You know, next week at Easter, we're going to focus in a bit more deeply on what this is, but I just want us to stop and consider what is Jesus actually asking of us? Okay, just, he is God, right? Come to earth in the flesh to teach us about life, the very life that he himself made. And he's demonstrating his power and his goodness to us, healing diseases and disabilities, and serving the lowly and despised. He's showing us his own merciful and loving heart, and he's inviting us into a personal relationship with him, promising to walk with us and guide us and carry us, showing us very clearly that we don't deserve to have this, but offering to give us his very own perfect life that we can and willing to suffer that we can have it. He's offering us a life now of meaning and purpose, a life where we finally come home, where we're loved and accepted and valued and treasured, and a future of ultimate pleasure and joy in his presence. If we'll only what? Listen to him. See the reality of this world for what it is. If we'll value him and his plans above all else, if we'll trust him and entrust ourselves to him, knowing that he is good 
and has our best in mind. That's what it means to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. It's a decision that he is more important than anything else in my life. That my career is not the most important thing, but his kingdom is. That my happiness is not the most important outcome, but his glory is. That my uh, loyalty is first to him and then my family's expectations. That faithfulness to him is better for me than popularity with others. There's a great old hymn that has been redone a few years ago uh, that I think really captures the heart of what Jesus is calling us to see here. It's called uh, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, an old hymn redone. The lyrics will be on screen, but when you read fair, don't think like equal, fair, or don't think fair hair. Okay, Fair is the idea of beauty, and awe and uprightness and goodness. Uh, among all the things good and right, Jesus is the fairest, the best, superior. Just have a, have a look through this. We'll work through it. Fairest Lord Jesus, Lord of all creation. Jesus of God and man, you will I cherish. You will I honor. You are my soul's delight and crown. Fair are the meadows. Fair are the woods, robed in the blooms of spring. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. They can bring so much joy to us as we head out into creation and see them. But Jesus is fairer. Jesus is purer. He makes the saddest heart to sing. Fair are the flowers. Fair are the children, beautiful in all their youth. Yet is their beauty Fading and fleeting, Lord Jesus, yours will never fade. Fair is the moonlight, fairer still the sunshine, fair is the starry sky. Think of the universe as big and vast as it is, beautiful. My Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines clearer than all the heavenly host on high. All fairest beauty, heavenly and earthly. Enter in your own word there. What is it that you find most wonderful and beautiful? Jesus, it is in you that it is found. None can be nearer, fairer or dearer than you, my Savior, to me bound. Our Lord who is with us, better than anything else. To consider Jesus any less than that is to deny him, to deny your cross, and to lose your life. His call is extreme, isn't it? But it's because he knows the alternative. He's not seeking half-hearted followers who have his agenda sitting side by side by the agendas of this world, agendas that even Satan himself could get on board with. No, he knows that his death and resurrection is the only lifeline thrown out to a helpless and hopeless humanity. There is no other path to eternity. Friends, will you get on board his agenda? Will you side with him? Lose your life to find it in him. Not just a couple of areas of your life, but all of it. I wonder what might it look like for you today as you go out to deny yourself to find life in Jesus. I think the first and obvious step is saying just what Peter said, isn't it? You are the king and not me. That's the first step. You are the king. You are God and I am not and I need you. But after that, what what might it look like? Here's a number of ways that I've seen others in this community even uh, do this. I think of Margaret who we interviewed last night, uh, who's from Liberia at the outreach event, who as a teenager, her parents would tell her that if she goes to church on a Sunday, She's not going to get any food that day. But she would still decide to go and trust that God would provide. And he would through the family she had in her church community. I think of Dom from our evening service who gave up a scholarship to study at Cambridge University in the UK to stay here and continue witnessing to his family who don't yet know Jesus. I think of Akoya who gave up a sprinting career because she considered her friends who don't yet know Jesus more important 
than winning races, and she wanted to make sure that she had enough time for them. It's the person that I know who stood face to face with their abuser in court and said the words, I forgive you, because they knew how much they'd been forgiven from, by Jesus. It's my other friend who owns a successful business. He's earning the big bucks, but you wouldn't know it by the way he lives because he's very generous with his money, supporting others, giving to the church, giving to God's work in various ways, denying himself and his rights to live comfortably for the sake of Jesus. It's the many men and women I know who have stayed faithfully single for the sake of serving Christ because they know that he is better. It's the guy or many guys who have made the hard decision to commit themselves to our men's reset groups because they wanted to kill sin for the sake of faithfulness to Jesus. I think of Phil Wilson in our morning congregation who gave up his lunch times at work to run an explaining Christianity course and invited everybody at his work in and he actually saw someone turn their life over to Jesus. This morning as you came in, it was only raining lightly, but in the first service, as I came through the car park, Sean was standing outside, soggy feet, soggy trousers, because he wanted to deny his comforts of coming inside nice and dry to help others come into the car park safely for the sake of Jesus. Taking up our cross is going to look different for each and every one of us, but it will mean sacrifice. I could have been very fit and muscly by now in the personal training career that I gave up to follow Jesus into ministry. But I lost nothing. And I gained everything, let alone a few kilos. His agenda is always better than mine. That's what we need to think. I want to just let you listen to the last recorded words of the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon, who for over 40 years gave himself sacrificially to people through depression, through sickness, through suffering. And these were his last words recorded in his last sermon. You might even want to close your eyes and listen. This won't be on the screen. I'll close with this. He says, every man must serve somebody. We have no choice as to that fact. Those who have no master are slaves to themselves. Depend upon it. You will either serve Satan or Christ, either self or the Savior. You will find sin, self, Satan, and the world to be hard masters. But if you put on the uniform of Christ, you will find him so meek and lowly of heart that you will find rest unto your souls. The heaviest end of the cross lies ever on his shoulders. If he bids us carry a burden... He carries it also. If there is anything that is gracious, generous, kind and tender, yes, lavish and abounding in love, you always find it in him. He says, these 40 years and more have I served him. Blessed be his name. And I have had nothing but love from him. I would be glad to continue yet another 40 years in the same dear service here below if it so pleased him. His service is life. Peace, joy. Oh, that you would enter on it at once. God help you to enlist under the banner of Jesus Christ even this day. Amen. Friends, pray with me. Now, good God, we know that we don't know how good it is to give up everything for Jesus. And we ask, Lord, today that you would help us see. Help us weigh up the cost of what it took for us to know you. To see you giving all it took for us to have eternity in your presence. We ask that you would help us see the things in this world that will lead us away from Jesus. And give us the courage to deny ourselves, our wants our desires to give them up for eternal joys and pleasure with Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.